Greetings, friends, and good morning. Thank you for joining me this morning. Today, we are resuming our study in 1 Corinthians, and we're going to read chapter 2 and 3 this morning. So just a quick uh, overview of, or backdrop of what we're going to be getting into. Uh, we're going to be reminded, first and foremost, that human wisdom is is complete vanity. Um, and that the things of God are to be spiritually discerned. And it, there, there's going to be a conversation here about just the the man's wisdom versus God's wisdom and and which one and the other well the one makes the other one kind of foolish and they just don't mix very well we're going to be looking at that and then there's going to be this conversation uh, in chapter 3 about the carnal mind the carnal Christian and how that carnal state of being prevents true spiritual growth it's like, why am I not getting closer to God? Why am I not growing in my faith? Well, there's an answer to that question. And a lot of it has to do with your own actions. And so that's kind of what's on the agenda for this morning. I'm praying that you'll be blessed. I'm praying that your hearts will be pierced. And that these words will cause you to draw closer to God this morning. Quick reminder, this broadcast is 100% listener supported. And you can do that by going to scriptureandprophecy.com. Alright, let's dig in and have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3. We'll be reading from the King James Bible this morning. Verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Please note, right out of the gate, there's an important point that's being made. Number one. Paul does end up going into a lot more details about the Christian faith with the Corinth church. What he's getting at here is, you know, when it comes to dealing with new Christians, and specifically unbelievers, there's really only one message at that, at that point, at that beginning stage. <laughs> there's only one thing to talk about. There's only one thing to preach to unbelievers those who are just hearing about the faith for the first time, and that is Christ crucified. There's no point, there's no reason to go into any other Christian doctrines and Christian mysteries and other th theological thoughts until you have the most important and foundational part, which is that Christ died for your sins and that God rose him again on the third day, you have to believe upon that. You have to trust upon that. There's no reason to bother with anything else until you've got the basics of the gospel down. Now, it would also be foolishness, and you're going to create some very weak Christians if that's the if if you never expound upon the Word of God and you never learn more about him and about his son Jesus and about the Old Testament and how it points to Jesus and, and about sin and, and all these things. You know, you need those things. But to begin, you have to start with Christ crucified. And that's what Paul did with this Corinthian church. Now, he's going to run into some problems trying to go deeper into the word. He's going to be, and we're going to see that in chapter 3, where he's going to talk about, I really want to be t giving you some meat, but you're still, you still have to be fed milk, uh, like a baby. And he's going to explain why that is once we get to chapter 3. Um, but this is, this is important for us to understand when we're dealing with, with, an, with unbelievers. The, the first and foremost thing is the basics, which is, 
Jesus Christ and him crucified. Okay. For I determined to know for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Paul's, Paul's making a point that if the religious leadership had godly wisdom instead of worldly wisdom, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord. But they didn't. Continuing on, verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak not in the words which men's wisdom teaches, but with the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is, he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So that's kind of where chapter 2 ends. We're going to read chapter two or chapter 3 here in a second. The, th- the point I was trying to make early, and I'm, I'm doing a terrible job of articulating it this morning. That Here's the thing. If you're full of the world's wisdom, you're, you actually become a fool, Right? Like, uh, the, the people who who re- have rejected God, and they, they've got all these uh, letters before their names, or maybe they've got all these, uh, you know, pieces of paper from institutions that tell them how brilliant they are, and and they think of themselves as wise, and they and, and they think of themselves as as great f- philosophical thinkers or scientists or whatever. They're actually fools. They don't know the things of God. And the things of God are the things that are actually true, that actually matter. And you can't really know the things of God if you're full of all that worldly wisdom, right? Like you've got you've to receive the truth that can only be found in God's word and through having the spirit of God that lives in you. And once you understand those things, you realize how foolish the world's wisdom is. I think that's the point that Paul is trying to make. And he says, they, those who, those who are full of the world's wisdom, like they can't even see the real truths. Uh, if we go back to first, uh, the first chapter that we covered a couple weeks ago, in 1 Corinthians, if you go back to verse 18, he says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to unto us which are saved it is the power of God. So like to us it's everything. And we understand that. But to those who are perishing, the gospel sounds like nonsense. The idea that God sent his son and that his son died for our sins in our place on that wooden cross at Calvary. 
and died and then rose from the dead. To them, that sounds like absolute nonsense. But to us, it's the power of God. It's everything. Now, there's a thing that hinders spiritual growth here that Paul's getting ready to get into. So let's have a look. Chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So right out of the gate, Paul's saying, I can't talk to you about like real deep spiritual things. Like I have to talk to you like a baby. And here's why. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and the other saith, I am of Paulus, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? To start with, Paul's saying, your carnal mind, your worldly minds, are preventing you from growing spiritually and being prepared to take on the deeper things of God. You can't comprehend the deeper things of God because you're too wrapped up in the world. You're too carnal-minded. All you can handle is the basics. This is why you feel... This is why you're not growing. This is why you're not... Get, why you're struggling to understand the more spiritual, deeper, meatier things of God. Like, you got a carnal mind. You have a worldly mind. That's what he's getting at. And the specific issue that he's dealing with with the Corinthians is they're like, and he mentioned it in the first chapter, you know, some of them are saying, well, I'm followers of Paul. Well, I'm Paul. It's, it'd be, it'd be kind of like if we're arguing over who, you know, what, a, which great Christian leader that we follow, you know, like maybe, well, I'm a follower of Calvin and I just follow anything that Calvin says or, I'm a follower of Lutheran, and I've, I only follow what Lutheran says. Paul's saying, look. Well, let's just, let's just let Paul say it for himself. Verse 5. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? He's saying, the Lord just used us to open your eyes and open your ears to the truth about him. We we're not no, we're nothing more than seed planters, as he's getting ready to describe. But it's God who actually opens up hearts and minds, and it's God who actually gives the growth. He says, verse six: I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. He's saying we're nothing more than we planted some seeds and maybe watered it a little bit. But God is the one that does the real work. So we preach the gospel. There's the seed planting. What I'm doing behind the microphone right now, reading the word of God. This is seed planting. That's all I'm doing. I'm just tossing seed out there. It's up to God to open up people's eyes and hearts and to cause a spiritual growth within them. Now, verse 8, He that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Let me make a point that's going to make people mad right now. This is my view, and it's always been my view, and I've written about it in my books, and I've talked about it on this podcast a thousand times. This is what I believe the scriptures teach, not just in this one little verse here, but throughout all the scripture. Salvation is a free gift, right? You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's a free gift. God opens your eyes. You believe upon his son and you get saved. We, we pretty much as Christians unanimously agree on that. But when it comes to rewards in heaven, those are earned through your works. 
the rewards that you'll receive in heaven comes from the labor that you do for the kingdom of God. It's in the Bible over and over and over, especially throughout the New Testament. Jesus even says, don't store up treasures here, right? Where the thief can steal it and it'll rust. Store up treasures in heaven. What does Paul say? Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Every man shall receive his own reward according to what? To his labor. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So he's going to get into some more important truths here as we wrap up this chapter. And... But I just wanted to make that point because people distinguish things differently and they'll immediately say, oh, well, that's works. Re-. No, it's not works religion. I'm not saying you earn salvation. You don't. It's a free gift of God. And I believe God is the one that opens your eyes to receive that free gift. So it's completely ordained by the Lord. But he prepares good works for us to do. And our actions matter. And our actions demonstrate what we believe. And there's going to be a day when we stand before God and our works are either going to be burned up in front of him, in front of us, because they were from pure mot- or impure motives, um, or they won't. Uh, Jesus talks about the parable of the talents, right? We, you have a guy who doubled it. You have two guys who who went out and they multiplied the, the talent that was given to them. But then the servant who did nothing with his talent, when the master came back, back, he says, You wicked servant. Your portion will be with the hypocrites. You wicked servant. You did nothing with the talent I was giving you. So your actions matter. There's going to be eternal consequences to your actions. Again, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about heavenly rewards for the labor that you did for the kingdom of God here on earth. You can get mad. You can argue with me about that if you want. That's just my belief. Let's move on. We've got about 10 more verses here. Paul's talking about how he built a foundation and then other people build upon that foundation. Verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So he's saying, what's the foundation? The foundation is Jesus Christ. Like, that's where it all starts. Verse 12, now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Could it be more clear? If, if, if your work, I, I, but what I think Paul is dealing with is, 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 is it godly work and is it with the right motives? Because it's, it's all going to be tested by fire. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved yet, so as by fire. Do you see the distinguishing thing? He's saying, so let's say your works, you, you stand before God, your works just burn up. Like, they're not very good, and they're not with the right motives, right? So they burn up. Maybe you had, Maybe in your heart you had selfish ambition for what you were actually doing. Paul says your works will be burned up, so there'll be no reward for that, but you yourself will still be saved. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. What's the loss? The works. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Why? Because that part is a free gift from God and cannot be earned. Right. Verse 16. 
Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defileth the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. We talked about that earlier. You can't be both. If you think you're wise in this world, set that aside. Learn God's wisdom so that you can actually be wise. For the wisdom, verse 19, of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their craftiness, in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thought of the wise, and that they are vain. In other words, worthless. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God. Well, there we have it, friends. I hope I did a good job of explaining the, and distinguishing between or distinguishing what, what Paul's trying to say about how you, being wise in this world has no value. The, the wisdom, men, man's wisdom is not only wrong, but to God it's foolishness. And those of us who have God's wisdom, we have the true wisdom, but we're going to seem like fools in the eyes of the world. You can't have both. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can't be white knuckle in the world while at the same time trying to you know, <laughs> grab, grab onto the terrain of God's robe, right? Like he, you have to die to one of them. You can only serve one master. Is it going to be this world and the world's wisdom? Or is it going to be God? Are you going to continue with that carnal mind? That worldly mind, you're going to continue to, fu the, to pump your brain full of nonsense? I mean, how can, you, how can you sit in front of just godless television for four or five hours a day and then expect to wake up the next morning and actually serve God? I'm not talking about just all television. I'm just, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the filth and the propaganda and the nonsense that gets pumped in through some of these perversities from the TV. Your eyes are like the window to the spirit. How can you how can you continue to feed yourself the world and then expect to be serving God the next day with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul? Something's got to give somewhere. I hope I'm making my point. I feel like I'm going in circles here. I hope that I've made the point. I hope that your hearts are pierced. And hopefully the Spirit of God has used me, this flawed human being, uh, to, to, to reach uh, the hearts of those of you listening through this podcast. Thank you for your time this morning, friends. Peace and grace be with all of you. And until next time, God bless.